From the campus of Yale University, this is Business Talk with Jim Campbell, nationally syndicated across the country on the Biz Talk radio network and coming to you from our flagship stations, Yale Radio WYBC and 1490 AM WGCH Greenwich. All talk and all business, 60 minutes of radio with leading figures from the world of business along with the business of politics and sports. Inside the revolution at GE, that's today on Business Talk with Jim Campbell. We're going to be talking first with a GE executive and then two leading organizational behavior professors from an outside perspective. First up, Paul Davies is employee experience leader at GE. He's charged with helping drive the radical transformation of GE's culture. Before we start, i got to throw this in. We're taping the day after the Cubs ended the 108-year curse. I grew up in Chicago. Feel blessed. I only had to wait 61 years. Congratulations to the Cubs. Welcome to Paul. Hey, Jim. Great to be with you. And having just moved from Chicago, congratulations to the Cubs. (laughs) And uh, you're adding a little bit of a class to our show tonight with that nice Australian accent. There you go. It's not Bostonian. Okay, so I'm a student of corporate culture, and we've got a a, a radical transformation going on here. Are you a revolutionary? Wow, big term. I I hope so. Uh, I wouldn't be in the job if I wasn't. All right, what is an employee experience leader? Where do you fit into the organization? Yeah, Jim, so reporting-wise, I report through to our chief human resources officer, but at the end of the day, what we're focused on is really driving employee experience across three different areas, and that's in the digital space, so the tools and technology that we provide our employees. It's the physical space, so the work environment that we create, and then also the cultural aspects of being a GE employee. All righty. Putting this major change in perspective, GE has, uh, over the last several years, divested plastics, appliances, insurance, media, NBC, Universal, their finance, GE Capital being the most recent. Is this the death knell of the conglomerate model? Is it the end of the GE sort of management structure? No, not at all. Look, this is just the ongoing evolution of the company, Jim. Uh, I was an employee of Plastics when the announcement came out. Uh, I've also worked in GE Capital, so uh, that obviously has a much smaller footprint these days. We'll continue to evolve the portfolio in a way that makes sense for us. Uh, I think it's uh, the right portfolio moves, and we need to change from a cultural perspective as well. Okay, let's lead into the first big one that's going on. What exactly is GE Digital and this move to a digital industrial company? I think the easiest way to describe this one, Jim, is how we're connecting our assets uh, to the Internet. If you think about the portfolio over time, we've been very focused on assets, and we used to sell our equipment. We continue to sell equipment. And then we realized that servicing that equipment over the life of the asset was a great source of revenue for us. And this move to digital is just an evolution. It's just the continuing uh, evolution of the company as we look to put assets uh, or sensors on our assets to drive revenue uh, through analytics and predictive modeling. So could I say this is an evolutionary flow of the portfolio attached to a revolutionary change in culture to make it happen? I think you have to do both uh, together to make it happen. Uh, Being a digital industrial means that we need to think differently uh, in the market. The pace of the market has changed. The technology that we're using has changed. So uh, we have to do both at the same time. GE, of course, not known as a software company, and that's now one of your big missions. And, And it's the Internet of really big things at GE. What's the leverage point? Is it big data? What are you actually trying to do before we talk about the architecture? So if you think about any of our assets, whether it's an aircraft engine, an MR machine, or a CT machine that comes out of our healthcare portfolio, uh, those machines spit out a ton of data. And the value for us and for our customers is really understanding those assets, how they perform over time, how we can drive productivity for our customers. Uh, Imagine uh, a locomotive, right? If we can make that locomotive run a mile quicker for our customers, uh, save them fuel, get them to their destination quicker, They are all savings that go into uh, our customers' pockets. You know, it's interesting. I kind of view this a little bit. uh, A model that GE Capital sort of uh, emerged in was providing financial services links to uh, industrial commercial accounts. And you're sort of talking the same thing now, except using software to leverage commercial industrial accounts. Absolutely. And we have, you know, it was interesting when we started down the journey of software, Jim, you know, all of a sudden we looked into the different portfolio companies and realized that software sales alone were a significant part of the business. And so in 2015, we put our arms around all of that and we created GE Digital um, to pull all of those capabilities, software, technology, uh, all of our analytics capability into one place. 
Okay, so let me see if I can understand how, you, how you're going to make this industrial elephant dance. I spent a lot of time up in Schenectady. I've got kids that went to Union. GE Schenectady's got this huge GE plant right in the middle of town. How will GE Digital interact directly with, say, the plant in Schenectady? Yeah, great question. So a couple of things we talk about. Uh, one is we have digital teams embedded in each of our businesses. So the GE Power business that you talk about up in Schenectady, we have a digital team led by our chief digital officer who reports through to our CEO of GE Power, but also to our CEO of GE Digital. So we are aligned both from a software and digital capabilities perspective uh, with the needs of the business and our customers in the power business. So that means we have alignment. How, How they'll interact is as we design and produce new turbines out of that facility, uh, we'll want to make sure that we cover those assets with sensors, which down the track will help our customers make better decisions on running their turbines. So GE Digital will not just be some silo with software engineers hanging out over here with the rest of the business over the other side. Uh, we, ha- we have to do both. So we have to have engineers, software engineers, and digital capabilities embedded in the business so they understand mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. the drivers in that industry. Uh, but also they need to be able to work in a, a shared service or a center of excellence, for lack of a better term, uh, to make sure that we're driving consistency across the platform and we're learning and sharing across the portfolio. Okay, let me ask, uh, this is kind of related to that. Uh, up the road from uh, the big power plant there is GE Research in Niskayuna. How will the software engineer side interact with GE Research, or, or will they be integrated? You, you know the uh, geography very well. Um, <laughs> so Niskayuna is a great place for us, and our Global Research Center does wonderful things, far, far more than I'm possibly able to comprehend. Uh, but the way that the Research Center comes in is we have a, an amazing pool of data scientists who help our software engineers and ultimately our customers to interpret data, to help with things like machine learning and artificial intelligence. So we're leaning into the Global Research Center, combining the power of that organization with digital to hopefully give even better customer outcomes. Turning to culture a little bit, I, my involvement when I was consulting and uh, with for KPMG Consulting and we got brought in, Six Sigma was a big deal. They wanted us to get trained in it. Six Sigma is really a culture of perfection almost, eliminating every mistake. Silicon Valley is more of a beta test trial and error. How are you going to put those together? Yeah, great question, Jim, and this is something that uh, we're trying to tackle each and every day because on the one hand, we want to get to market quicker, right? And if you learn from Silicon Valley, it's all about minimal viable products, uh, iteration, pivoting, learning from the customer quickly, failing fast and getting to market. Uh, And you're right, the contrast there with Six Sigma is all about minimizing defects uh, and ultimately getting to perfection. I think you and and your listeners should absolutely know that when they're flying on an aircraft with one of our aircraft engines on the outside, we absolutely believe in uh, excellent product quality. But I think the point here is how do we get to market quicker? How do we work through a new product innovation process in a much quicker way, testing with customers before we have a perfect product, but just saying, what are you looking for? What features are important to you, to your customers in your industry, so that we're not spending time uh, going down a path that perf- where perfection isn't required, and we can pivot and learn with the customers along the way. Interesting. Very honest answer there that you, you do recognize the contention. You're going to work on it. Will it be tough or, or you have to overcome, uh, say, a, a sense of fear of failure that, the, you know, traditionally you didn't want to make mistakes at GE if you were going to move up? Obviously, you're, you're going to change that DNA a little bit, right? Right. So we talk about failing fast, but learning quickly, right? Um, failing fast at a, at a scale that isn't consequential or material for the company, but taking learnings from that and applying them elsewhere. And so it, it is a challenge that we have culturally. Uh, we've started something that we called FastWorks, and FastWorks is an initiative bred straight out of Silicon Valley. We brought a number of uh, well-known entrepreneurs in-house and asked them to help with uh, a Six Sigma equivalent initiative, but focused on learning how to act and think like uh, Silicon Valley entrepreneurs. And so we've rolled out that FastWorks program uh, right around the world. And Jim, the goal is simply to think and act quicker so that we can return value to customers sooner. That's interesting. FastWorks was my next question. Oh, there you go. By the way, one of the things I read from somewhere, I don't know if Laura gave it to me or not, but the key improvement of the development cycle, that uh, I read the new gas turbine, you took the development cycle down to one and a half years from five years. That's pretty amazing. Yeah, I'm not aware of that uh, particular one, Jim, but what I will say, there is a, a great example in our transportation business 
where we took uh, a marine engine. We had some Tier 4 regulations, which ultimately uh, mandate the emission standard. And we were able to bring that new product to light in the market two years ahead of our customer, uh, to, of, of our competitor. And we believe that was because we approached it with a FastWorks approach, uh, failing fast, learning quickly in partnership with our customers so that we ultimately got a great product to market quickly. And I also turned up a quote in my research, uh, CEO Jeff Immel saying he's tired of hearing a five-year plan, so everything's <laughs> being pushed at a greater speed there. You're listening to Business Talk with Jim Campbell over the Business Talk Radio Network, 350 stations around the country. Next, we're going to go inside the performance appraisal revolution at GE. We're talking with GE employee experience leader from GE Corporate, Paul W. Davies. And I always say that people behave how they're paid. So if GE is going to be successful in putting in this big change, everything's got to be in alignment on the incentive motivation side. And I understand that they're actually throwing out the old static annual performance reviews, which were heart and soul of corporate America and certainly GE. Tell us what's going on. Jim, it's gone. It's absolutely gone. And uh, it was a, a process that we uh, lived with for 40 years in the company. And uh, in 2014, we realized that we needed to have a much more contemporary approach to performance management. And we came out with what we now call performance development. Uh, we tried it on a really small scale. Uh, again, we wanted to uh, leverage some of those fast works techniques that we'd been teaching our employees. And so we started small. And we started with a small pilot group of 6,000. Uh, we learned in the fourth quarter of 2014 uh, what worked, what didn't. Uh, we pivoted, and then 2015, we moved to 100,000 people on the new platform. And earlier this year in July, we actually communicated to all of our employees that the new performance development approach will be our standard to performance management and that we're moving away from performance ratings. So new approach, no ratings, very, very different to the uh, old GE. Now, uh, of course, GE was famous in the Jack Welch year for sort of the ranking and rip. The top 10% have got to go away each year. Has that all been killed? It's absolutely gone, Jim. So we have moved away from rack and stack. I, you know, 20, 70, 10 are the terms that we used to use, A players, B players, C players. Mm -hmm. This is much more about real-time feedback. It's much more about setting those priorities at any point in the year. In the, in the old process, we used to set our priorities at the beginning of the year, and we'd come back and revisit them in December. Uh, we realized, even through the pilots, that so much changes in a year, and the speed of life is increasing. So we needed a process around performance okay. development that would help. Is this a softer thing than, than the traditional harder metrics? And tell us what the continues, considers, priorities, what all this stuff means in the continuous improvement HR you know, appraisal system now. Yeah, so we, uh, we supplement the performance development approach with a, an app. It's mobile-enabled. Uh, we try desperately, Jim, not to talk about the tool so much as a, a change in behaviors and a change in culture. We found that in the past, uh, communications tended to be up and down the ladder, so from employee to manager to one over one. Uh, and in the new world, we realize that people are working in organic teams, right, networks of teams, teams of teams. And so giving and receiving feedback can be essentially between anyone in the company. And that's what the new process enables, is we can give anyone in the company feedback, uh, and they in return can give us feedback. We changed the term. Uh, we've moved to a term that we call insights. Uh, we learned that feedback can sometimes put people on the defensive. And we really wanted people to be open to insights so that they took them on board and where necessarily pivoted their behavior so that they could deliver new outcomes. All right. So tell me, is part of this driven by millennials having some sort of a different approach to, to what motivates them? And second part of that is how is this uh, your new approach affecting longer term GE employees? Yeah, so let me, let me start off by saying we have about 35% of our population today is actually millennial. But I would say that it wasn't the millennials that necessarily drove us to this new approach. It was simply the market. The speed at which market and industry today is changing uh, meant that we had to catch up as it related to performance development. So 
the market is what drove us there. The millennials, in my experience at least, have uh, really embraced the new performance development approach. I think what they do outside of the four walls of GE now feels very similar to what they do inside as it relates to feedback and collaboration online in real time. And what I would say from the the many employees that I've interacted over the, the last 18 months on the new performance development approach, people like the lighter touch. This is not a a huge paper writing exercise at the end of the year. It's incremental bits of feedback throughout the year that ultimately uh, lead to a a less formal discussion, still important, but uh, lighter touch. The company was always known for a very formal succession and grooming process. You'd have meetings almost set years in advance. Is that that all that stuff still in, in place? Absolutely. So succession planning, uh, leadership development is still absolutely yeah. a critical part of our ongoing business continuity and vitality, quite frankly. So we haven't lost any of that. We hope that we supplement it with richer feedback along the way. Okay. You've got to make transformational change, but you obviously want to hold on to the enduring values. What are, what are the key values that GE wants to make sure they hold on to? Yeah, so I would say we came out with a new set of GE beliefs, and I won't go through all of those, Jim, but they're things like customers determine our success, stay lean to go fast, empower and inspire each other. Uh, We absolutely want to win as a team together. Uh, I think this concept of simplification is also key. Um, We have a big, complex, global organization, and we need to empower our managers right throughout the organization. And so being a simple, nimble, agile company is difficult when you're large, uh, but we have to drive decisions from the bottom and from the middle of of the organization if we're going to act with the speed that we need. Okay, I want to move to the learning culture, continuous learning culture. I like something I read that the goal is to grow however you choose. Uh, What is digital learning now there? I know you guys spend over a billion bucks on it, I think, in the Brilliant You program as well. Yeah, so we spend over a billion dollars in in development in total across the company each year, and it's a huge investment in our people. Uh, The Brilliant U platform, something that uh, uh, we're very proud of, this is built on machine learning and algorithms. And essentially, it's taking the consumer world and bringing it inside. So when you go to your Amazon app or to your Yelp app, and it suggests uh, restaurants that you should eat or products that you should buy, we're doing something similar with Brilliant U, where uh, the, the system, the platform, suggests to you what it thinks uh, would be most beneficial for you from a learning perspective. And it's looking at other people like you around the world who have done similar courses and said, hey, this was really useful for me. Um, And for those courses that aren't useful and we see thumbs down, uh, just like Darwinian theory, those courses drop off and we no longer see them again. You've reimagined the Crotonville Leadership Center, which was uh, obviously a key part of GE's upper level management development. What have you done there? We reimagined Crotonville back in, uh, I want to say 2009, 2010 period. And what we realized, Jim, that Crotonville is an institution for GE employees. It's a place that people aspire to. They hear about it right around the world. Uh, And we send our leaders there from right across the world to really invest in their development. And as we thought about transforming the culture, Crotonville had to be the source of that change. And so in the past, you would have gone to Crotonville and you would have sat in a classroom-style setting. You would have sat in a theater style. Um, Now we have a a barn where people can sit on couches, and um, it feels a lot more contemporary, and it certainly enables a lot more collaboration and relationship building than than maybe the more structured um, formal settings of prior years. Um, So we've really reimagined what we want people to experience when they're at Crotonville so they can take that back and replicate that in their own businesses wherever they are in the world. Sounds a little bit Silicon Valley-ish. Now, part of your your job was the employee life cycle from uh, hire to retire. Wondering how how you change that, and are you trying to make your benefits packages look more like Silicon Valley? Well, so a couple of things. Uh, We have to compete uh, around the world in all the different uh, industries that we play in. So it's really important that we mirror industry uh, as it relates to compensation and benefits. So that's a given. Uh, What I would say is that flexibility and personalization is just a trend that isn't going to go away. And so as we think about our past practices, uh, we're being forced now, again, due to market changes, we've got to be able to think about an individual and what an individual might need. And that's not always monetary, right? Some people uh, would prefer extra vacation days. Some people would prefer childcare. So we're really grappling with that at the moment, and we're looking to personalize our compensation and benefits platforms, mainly driven by changing uh, market practices. All right, coming next, Inside the Cultural Revolution at GE. (music) 
We're back with employee experience leader, GE revolutionary in many ways, Paul Davies. And we're going to look inside the cultural revolution side now. Uh, on GE Digital, who's running that or the skill set that's running that? Did you get them from uh, Silicon Valley? And, and I'm told that some of the folks you interviewed with uh, said, well, what the heck? GE doesn't even know what software is. What are we talking about here? <laughs> yeah, great question. So Bill Rue runs out GE Digital Business. Bill uh, grew up in the, the technology space. So we... Uh, absolutely have an expert at the helm of the business. And, and Jim, for us, and you may have seen these commercials on television, uh-huh. the Owen, Owen ads, right? Uh, those Owen ads have really helped to position us as a different type of employer. Uh, we really wanted to change the brand and the image that people had of the company. And we've had to do that. Uh, most companies these days in some way are competing with the Googles, the Facebooks, the Amazons for talent, particularly as it relates to software. So that's been a very successful campaign for us. I like to think that we have a wonderful purpose, um, not that our competitors don't, but if you think about this vision of being the premier digital industrial, uh, we hope that when people come to us, even though we may not be as well-known as others for software and digital, uh, that the things that we work on are big things um, that matter to the world. So um, are you modeling uh, this new vision on the Googles, Apples? Is there an organization that you're modeling on? And becoming a top 10 software company by 2020 is an incredibly ambitious goal. Right. Well, we're about $6 billion today in software sales across the company. That's public information. And we have said publicly that we aspire to be at $15 billion of revenue by 2020. So in reality, we are a a big player in the software space today. In terms of uh, mirroring other organizations or replicating what others do, I I think we're forging our own path. Uh, No one else is doing digital industrial quite like we are. So in many respects, this is exploration, and uh, hopefully we get it right. Um, Let me ask you, uh, the the movement uh, from the headquarters out of Fairfield, uh, Connecticut to Boston, um, and I know there's a lot of Connecticut fiscal challenges uh, and instability there. Was that move to to get into a Silicon Valley like the high tech, you know, Boston area? What what was what was behind that move? Certainly a number of factors, and and you touched on on one. But uh, being in Boston, and I live and breathe this every day. Uh, we're part of a vibrant. Uh, ecosystem. And I think about the Fairfield, Connecticut office, beautiful campus, beautiful building, uh, but not close to customers, <laughs> right? Uh, big offices, long hallways, not very empowering and inspiring. And if you think about the office space we have now, very open, lots of windows, people who had office space for 15, 20 years have a five foot stand up, sit down desk. So we're working in a very different way. And we can walk to customers, we can uh, walk to you know, 50 great schools, uh, maybe we take the T, but we have access to a huge range of resources that we never did as close as we did in Fairfield. Okay, give us a sense now of the scale. What kind of hiring is going on on the software engineering size? Uh, you've told us what the revenue goals are. How big is this organization going to look like? Yeah, so the, the business today is about 28,000 people around the world. Uh, we've uh, grown it rapidly. We do a ton of hiring out of Silicon Valley, but we realize that Silicon Valley isn't the only place that we can tap into resources. So we have what we call digital hubs uh, right around the world. Uh, we'll continue to add uh, as we uh, invest in our digital platform. Okay, um, so a lot of wave of change is going on. GE Capital has been, um, uh, I guess, basically broken off, sold off. Um, is, is there a lot of uncertainty and morale issues? Some folks that are that are that are still there that um, that have been in areas that have uh, no longer been at the core of GE's mission. Uh, look, I, I I have to say there there is going to be some people who feel a little bit disappointed by the transformation and the changing portfolio. Uh, I would say though that this compelling vision that we have to be the leading digital industrial company is a really compelling reason for people to stay and stick around. And I would say that we do a really nice job of helping people, Jim, uh, find uh, other roles in the company. Uh, we operate in a, in a range of industries, as you know, and uh, many many people are able to find alternative work uh, in the company. Okay, so how long do you see the process on the DNA side, the cultural change? How long is that going to take you? Yeah, that's a bit of a how long is a piece of string question. I think <laughs> our transformation and evolution continues. Um, Jim, we continue to you know, transform through the 90s, through the noughties, and now into the, this decade, and I suspect that will just continue. 
Okay, now I know that Jeff and Melt has said there's no plan B here. You guys have bet the ra- <laughs> you bet the ranch on this. Mm-hmm. What, what kind of risks uh, do you see that, that you're trying to say control or minimize or work around? Yeah, we're, we're certainly all in. I think our biggest challenge is uh, helping support this digital industrial culture. Jim, we have a number of people across the company who grew up in a different GE. And so part of the the dollars that we're investing is really about upskilling our people. How do we help people think differently? How do we people how do we help people uh, understand that failing in a small way but quickly is okay? That's where the dollars are being invested. That's why we're spending time on fastworks and helping our employees have the tools and capabilities that will help them be successful in a digital industry. Industrial world. Okay, so what are the critical success factors, or how are, you, how are you going to know you're being successful during this? Yeah, I think a couple of things. If I look at the performance development approach that I talked a little bit about, um, what we're seeing and one of the goals of performance development was for us to be more honest and candid with people. And I got to tell you, Jim, I've seen a number of times where people have stood up in a room full of people in front of senior leaders and literally given someone a consider insight, right? Giving them in the old, in the old term, a, a development need or a negative piece of feedback. Mm-hmm. And I would just say that that is a huge win in the past. Uh, that piece of feedback may or may never have been aired. Um, but at the, at, at this point, we're now being very courageous, very open, very frank and telling people how we feel. Uh, I want to ask you this on your own career because it it's kind of fascinates me. You've, you've worked for a bank, Northern Trust, which happens to, be, happens to be my bank, by the way. It's ex-Chicago. Tech company, HP. Industrial, of course, GE Plastics. You've done transformation work. Do you find they're essentially the same or it's fundamentally different in, each, each, in, in cultures that are so different like that? I think the, the proof of the pudding is in a compelling vision. Uh, The path to get to that vision is, of course, different as it relates to different company cultures. But where it's succeeded, uh, it's really when it's driven by a compelling vision uh, and leadership support. Uh, In your own case, you report up through the HR channel. How do you, uh, as an uh, employee experience leader, how do you interface directly with operating divisions yourself? Yeah, that's a great question. So I uh, have people in each of the businesses who look after employee experience. So it's a very informal network, and it's uh, probably how we work in a lot of ways in GE. We work informally across our relationships. Um, But at the same time, as you think about those three pillars, digital, physical, and cultural, uh, on the physical side, I reach into the facilities team that we have. And then on the digital side, I reach into our digital technology team as we think about this concept of employee experience in a aligned way. All right. I want to uh, finish up because it's been in the news, this proposed putting together of GE and Baker Hughes, which is an oil and gas company at a time when the oil and gas business is in a big slump and GE had made a bet on it. It seems a very creative way to sort of play out the cycle and also very different that it's going to be in a completely different uh, unit. Yeah, Jim, a really interesting one for us. Not quite a merger, not quite an acquisition. You know, we announced uh, earlier this week that we would take a 62.5% share of the new company, which we'll call Baker Hughes, a GE company. And then Baker Hughes shareholders will own 37.5% of that new company. I think it's a really interesting way to pull a deal together. We've got complementary technologies. We've got some overlap with customers. So uh, many of our customers know both of the entities. And look, time will tell, but it's a really fascinating and exciting way to bring those portfolios together. And GE will have the CEO. Uh, GE Lorenzo Simonelli, who currently runs the oil and gas business, will be the CEO of the new company. Now, typically GE has not monetized pieces of itself. Uh, there was no GE capital stock. This, this model that's just been developed, could you see down the road that maybe parts of the digital empire might end up becoming separate entities where they have stocks, which obviously gets closer to Silicon Valley, or, or that's still a no-no? The new Baker Hughes will absolutely still be able to tap into what we call the GE store, right? So still be able to tap into our global research centers, our GE digital uh, capabilities. So we'll, we'll run it, uh, and I'm sure Lorenzo will run it, um, to optimize uh, the shareholder value for the new company he will run. All right, we'll give you the last word here. Tell us uh, just how this passionately affects you. Put, put a wrapper on what's going on at GE right now. Yeah, look, we were in a transformation. It's one of those nebulous words, but we are all constantly changing. Um, the portfolio is changing. The skill sets that we look for are changing. The brand is changing. Uh, so it's, it's a constant change, and part of our 
uh, mission is to make sure that we bring people along for the journey, uh, making sure that our employees are equipped and skilled uh, at the right time so that they can ride the wave with us. Well, I really appreciate your time, Paul. I own the stock, I'm, so I'm betting GE pulls this off. I've got a family bet, too. I've got a daughter that works there. Uh, I want to thank you. I want to thank Laura Paredes for setting this up from GE Corporate Communications. It says uh, legions to me about uh, desire to be an open, transparent company when you cooperate uh, and do this kind of an interview. Coming next, leading organizational and GE experts give us an outsider perspective, two of them, on the GE revolution. Thanks a lot, Paul. Thanks, Jim. Noel Titchy, one of the nation's top experts on organizational behavior and a GE expert himself, a confidant of former GE CEO Jack Welch. He, together with Welch, revolutionized GE's Crotonville Management Development Center, instrumental in Welch's then transformation of GE. He's a professor at the Ross School of Business at the University of Michigan. He wrote Control Your Destiny or Someone Else Will with Jack Welch. Latest book, which was on the show for Succession, Mastering the Make-or-Break Process of Leadership, transition and last time he was on he predicted Jim Harbaugh would become the head coach of Michigan and he's doing a successful transformation of his own while we're on transformations. Welcome Noel, thanks for ducking out of a black tie dinner for a few minutes at the Waldorf. Go blue, Michigan's going to go all the way this year with Jim Harbaugh. It's certainly anyway. looking like it. All right, we've got a, a, another revolution uh, coming and uh, a major undiversification, which is probably not a word of, a, of what has been a conglomerate model, and major cultural changes, both in, in performance appraisal and going to become a digital GE, almost a Silicon Valley software. They bet the ranch. First off, has something like this been done in corporate America on this scale? And w- what's your thoughts on the whole deal? No, I mean, the closest would be the transformation that's going on at IBM. But I think GE uh, historically has been much more a diverse company. But it's gone through uh, all kinds of major transformations all the way back to Thomas Edison, who really launched the company. And every few decades, there's a reinvention of GE. Welsh did it. And Jeff Immel is currently reinventing the company. You mentioned IBM, which is, a, which is a good point. IBM seems to be struggling right now transforming themselves. Is that a good sign for GE since IBM's already in the tech business to, to basically 100%? Uh, IBM is in the midst of a transformation. Uh, GE is in the midst of a transformation. Siemens is in Europe. All of the major old line companies are going to have to reinvent themselves. 20 years ago, or actually even more now, when Jack Welch was there, diversification was really to, to try to improve the growth prospects with slow growth of the industrial side by going into the financial sector. This is kind of a reverse of that. Does, will they at some point regret that they may be too focused in terms of uh, if they hit a growth cycle that doesn't work as well? Yeah, but the good news about GE is you can rebuild the portfolio, and they've done it over time. I mean, GE Capital started out in the 1920s, if you go back and look at it, as we've got to lend people money to buy our refrigerators and, you know, kind of retail. And then mm-hmm. it wasn't until 50s and 60s that began to diversify. Larry Bossidy, uh, the vice chairman, made it even more diverse. But it, it, it was something that worked in its time. Does this represent a, a sort of final repudiation of the Welsh legacy uh, or the GE is conceding that they can't manage the complexity of a portfolio or, or you're just going to say it's natural evolution? I think it's a natural evolution. I think that what made Welch great was he responded to the environment in which he operated in, bought into businesses, sold businesses, exited businesses that didn't make sense. You know, they didn't make iron, you know, remember GE used to make irons, stuff like that. He got out of that. And Jeff Immel is going to get rid of businesses that aren't tomorrow's businesses, and he's going to build a portfolio in his view, and hopefully the market proves him right, that will make the company successful going forward. Interesting. I asked this of Paul Davies of GE, so I'll ask it of you too. GE known as a control organization um, in, in, in top-down, uh, very strong audit controls driven financially, very Six Sigma focus, which is no defects, perfection. 
Now, Silicon Valley is beta testing, trial and error, making mistakes. How do you how do you worry, or do you worry, or do you think it's possible they're going to graph th- those two DNAs together? I do a lot of work out in Silicon Valley. I work a long time with Intel, Intuit, with uh, Genentech, with a lot of these Silicon Valley companies, and I think most of them go to school on GE to develop the kind of discipline that they would like to develop. You know, I work with Google, which has a big facility in Ann Arbor. One of the founders is from the University of Michigan. You know, the fundamentals are the fundamentals. You know, basically, if you're going to grow top-line growth, you have to have new, new products, new markets, new innovations. If you're going to grow bottom line, you better worry about uh, things like Six Sigma, getting efficiency. The fundamentals of business will never change. And, uh, you know, I think Jeff Immel is going to drive both top-line growth, new opportunities, new businesses, uh, and he will keep driving kind of bottom-line efficiency. Interesting. What you're kind of saying is that uh, the, the whole GE process is a core competency, so they should be able to take it on. Let's look into the other big deal going on. They've, they've thrown out the rack and stack annual, very detailed, metric-driven uh, performance appraisal. They've thrown that out the window now to more of a continuous approach. What are your thoughts on that? It's a natural evolution for, you know, something that's consistent with what Jeff Immelt wants to do. By the way, it's, it's extreme to say there wasn't continuous evaluation. Mm-hmm. There actually was under Welsh. There were multiple times a year where you reviewed appraisals. I think it's more evolutionary than revolutionary. Okay, and as uh, GE is saying, they're all in on this, and Melt himself has said there's no plan B for this uh, GE Digital. W- what do you think are the biggest risk factors? Are you confident that they're going to be able to pull it off? I am confident, but it's, uh, it's a world where, you know, I, I do a lot of work out in Silicon Valley, and uh, I do work in China, and I do work in India. You know, it is a fast-moving world. And it's all going to be in, and by the way, Welsh is the one who started speed, simplicity, and Mm self-confidence. And speed is going to be a huge issue. And you have a flexible workforce that's able to make changes quickly is going to be the determinant of success. Go ahead, sorry. Go ahead. No, I I think it starts, well, it also, GE has always looked at the pipeline, who they hire off campus. They do about 2,000 off-campus hires a year of uh, engineers, IT people, uh, some MBAs, mostly IT and uh, engineering. That's going to continue. they got to keep pumping new talent in. And that's exactly what they're doing. Good points. Uh, as we finish off, this is going to be, uh, obviously, Jeff Melt's bet on his legacy. Do um, you feel good about that? Do you feel he waited too long? You can always second-guess that he was too slow off the uh, starting blocks. Um, who knows? I mean, he inherited, uh, you know, a uh, recession, you know, the blow up on Wall Street. No, I think he's, I think he's been very systematic at moving quickly, doing some very innovative things like building the uh, innovative uh, R and D lodge up in Schenectady, getting people more connected to moving new technologies. Um, so, I mean, school's out until we see the final results. But uh, I, I will bet on Jeff Immel being a very successful follow-on to Jack Welch. And he is a Dartmouth man, so we got to go with that as well. This is Business Talk with Jim Campbell. Be heard on the Business Talk Radio Network Sundays, 10 to 11 a.m. Eastern, and then again Sunday night, 10 to 11 Eastern p.m. You're listening to Business Talk with Jim Campbell. We've got more on GE's revolution. We're getting another outsider perspective. Ranjay Galati is the Jaime and Josefina Chuatiampo Professor, the head of the Organizational Behavior Unit and the chair of the Advanced Management Program at the Harvard Business School. That's a big mouthful, a lot to say. And I said as a Tuck graduate from Dartmouth, I don't often deal with Harvard Business School, but we're making an exception for GE. Welcome, Ranjay. How are you? Very well. Thank you very much. Okay. um, Appreciate your time. Tell us your level of insight in in GE, how you work with them. I understand you've been involved in their leadership, innovation, and growth program. Tell us uh, how how you understand GE. So uh, a lot of my involvement with GE has been through um, uh, their corporate education at Crotonville with the program they had called Leadership, Innovation, and Growth. 
And this is a, a program we developed for every single PNL inside GE. And uh, the leaders would come in along with the leadership team, and we'd go through a couple of days intensive, very action-focused learning. So the focus was not on just like come and learn some concepts. It was about what are you going to do to change the growth trajectory of your business. And, um, and so we did this, and then at the end of the days, we would uh, present to Jeff Immelt, and, and then after a few weeks, send him a commitment letter around how we're going to change the trajectory of the business around innovation and growth. Okay, uh, obviously you got a national represent, represent, uh, reputation on organizational behavior, so you get to look across a lot of corporate America. The scale of this GE revolution, uh, how, uh, compared to anything else, how big is this, how massive, how big a bet? Well, you know, you know GE, GE is a scale of a whole different magnitude compared to most corporations. Um, but, you know, what is really remarkable about GE is that, you know, in spite of its scale, you know, the effort to create distinct businesses and to create agility and nimbleness in the organization is something that I think is, uh, is actually a universal theme, not just among companies as big as GE. You know, even companies smaller than GE today, you know, agility, speed, being able to pivot in rapidly changing markets, these are common themes uh, that cut across GE and many other companies who may be even much smaller than GE. Okay, uh, this is a company that's been run by industrial and finance guys. Um, we're looking at a high-tech transformation uh, going. Uh, uh, can they do that? Do, can they find the DNA to do that? Well, I think they're very cognizant of what that change would look like. And, uh, and I, I'm very optimistic and hopeful because I think they've – They've really thought these are people who are very thoughtful and deliberate, and I think uh, they see that this is not a minor change. So I would tell you there's cause for concern if somebody thought of this as kind of tinkering on the margins. And by all the messages you probably heard from their leadership team, they see this as a, as a monumental change in the organization, and they're determined to make it see it through. And not only do I give him credit for that, but I found in the interview he was very honest that they understand there's, a, there's an inherent tension there about whether they can uh, pull this off or not. Tell us, in your mind, what is the GE Digital? What is it? What it's, what it's going to be? Well, I think, first of all, I think it's not so much of a light switch change. These changes had been away, already underway in GE for many, many years. I mean, if you go back, even under the previous CEO, Jack Welch. You know, Jack had made service the service push mm -hmm. that GE needs to make money on services. Then you saw, if you look in the aviation business, they had evolved their model from selling engines and selling services to maintain those engines to power by the hour. So you have a risk-reward sharing with the customer. You get paid if the engine flies. If you don't get paid, if the engine doesn't fly. And so they had evolved, and then in that way you were tied to the customer that meant you were doing remote diagnostics. That meant you were doing preventative maintenance. That meant, you know, you were really in there trying to keep the engine running. That meant you were doing analytics already to see what was likely to break down. Um, they're just taking this to the next level, and, and I think they're doing it more broad scale. It was happening in bits and bytes. Uh, some of these things were happening, um, and I think now with taking on the Internet of Things and digitization, I think they want to make this, really the centerpiece, not something that they do in addition, but becomes kind of the mainstay of the company. Is, is GE going to be more Silicon Valley, or is Silicon Valley going to evolve more to be like GE? Uh, now, you know, um, so look, I think people have this idea that somehow Silicon Valley is this thing, and I mm -hmm. know that even GE has built their center in uh, San Ramon, California. Mm -hmm. I think you have a lot of competencies and distinctive ideas there, um, and I think you'll see some of this coming into GE. So I think I would say there's more of Silicon Valley, if you will, and I say that very loosely and tentatively um, because I don't think it'll be like suddenly you have mini Silicon Valley inside GE. I think the main thing you'll see is them embracing software solutions, uh, embracing a business model that entails not just selling industrial equipment, uh, but really in, uh, entails selling services. I mean, you look at salesforce.com, saying that, you know, we don't sell you, even license your software. We basically offer you a service. Okay, you're up there in Cambridge. Is this move uh, uh, from Fairfield to, to Boston, that's a symbolic move to, to uh, high-tech world? Um, I was there for the, the welcome speech that uh, Jeff Immelt gave. Um, 
when they were coming to, moving to Boston. And I think it's symbolic, but it's also substantive. I mean, they see uh, Boston as being a center of idea flow. You know, you have MIT, you mm-hmm. have Harvard, and you have a number of other great universities here. And and I think it, and you have industry. You know, you have biotech. The hub is over here. And and I want to remind everybody, you know, that you know, once upon a time, you know, Route 128 was the rival yes. to Silicon Valley. I got to throw Tufts in because I went there undergraduate. Yes, I would say <laughs> Tufts. I would say Northeastern. I would say BU. I would say BC. I mean, there's a lot of great universities. A ton of great like, in the Boston area. So I think it's it's universities, it's industry, it's talent. Um, and and I think it's, it's so I think they were smart to say that we need to be where idea flow is happening. If we're going to really really rethink our DNA of what we want to do and how we want to operate, I, I think they wanted to be where the idea flow is. And I think um, I'm personally delighted they're here in our backyard. So that's a very self-serving answer for me. But. And I have to say, being here from Connecticut, GE took a lot of grief for, for leaving, and, the, and the, the sense was, oh, they did it because our fiscal condition is bad. I really believe they did it more for the cultural uh, change. Let's switch over now to how they get this done uh, from a management incentive point of view. They've also revolutionized performance appraisals. They've, they've gotten rid of the famous rack and stack, fire the bottom 10%, detailed, metric-driven annual performance review. Talk about the changes there and, and what you think uh, the degree of success will be. So I think um, let's start from the beginning as to what's happening in the markets in in, in their markets today. You know, uh, this is true in every era, by the way. So I say it a little bit caution. In every era, you will always hear people, management saying that we are in the most turbulent time period ever, um, and either turbulence is going up or everyone thinks that they're in a more most unique situation. But it's true. Right now, you know, there is, I would say, a lot of change going on in markets. There's deglobalization happening, as you can see with populist movements everywhere. You're seeing technological shifts happening, dramatic competitive markets. Markets are becoming much more transparent. So all these things require companies to be able to pivot and move much more quickly than ever before. Uh, And this kind of speed... Uh, and being able to respond quickly to market shifts requires them to think about their organizations in ways where they can remain agile. Oh. Um, and this is, I think, is the is the mantra again. Agility, speed, uh, is the is the mantra you're hearing in a lot of companies today. GE being just one of them. Is part of this change that's being forced? Is it is the different values, cultures, cultures? of the millennials? Has Harvard Business School had to revamp itself at all uh, because of millennials? Um, So, again, there's a lot of loose talk about millennials. I haven't seen any real definitive research showing, you know, and again, I'm going to, again, rely on the the caricatures and here and there we talk about that, Mm -hmm. you know, millennials are different, they have different aspirations. Um, I think, but there are some enduring themes. I mean, for instance, People always wanted not just evaluation, but also development. And so if a company formalizes development and says, you know what, we need to be doing a more proactive job in developing our people on a regular, ongoing basis, where we establish trust between the manager and the subordinate, that it's not an antagonistic once-a-year stressful evaluation, uh, but actually it's an ongoing conversation. I think this is nothing new. Okay, let's finish up last with, um, I don't know if you want to attach a percentage probability, but what's the percentage you think that GE pulls this off? And secondly, um, and you talked a little bit about this, but how, do you think, how is it that GE is able to transform itself for now over 124 years? Are there any unique attributes? So a couple of things. First of all, on the pulling it off, I don't think there is a, a definitive on and off where they'll pull it off. I think this is going to be an ongoing journey. They're on that journey. The journey is going to continue. The path may change depending on how markets shift. But I definitely, you know, I am very hopeful and optimistic that this is a company that is going to be at least continue to adapt and adjust as it has over many years. I think the hallmark of survival and success of GE has been its continuous effort to reinvent itself, to innovate, adapt to circumstances, and and to be you know look ahead and see where markets are moving, and 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 you look at the companies that didn't make it, you know you see that somehow they got stuck in a moment in time whether it was Kodak or Polaroid, or it was Westinghouse, 
you know, there are many, many companies that were also iconic companies like GE that uh, somehow, you know, did not pivot. It's and a, it's a that great. That has been the hallmark of GE. It's a great uh, tribute to GE. As we, we that, looking back now, looking forward, um, what do you think that Jeff Melt's legacy is going to end up being? If you had to state it in a sentence or two, like people do about Jack Welch, you know, I, I think it's premature to talk about his legacy because he's still there. So I think we always talk about legacy after somebody leaves, and the legacy gets written once they're gone, and you look back and see. Um, what they've done, and I think, but I think there's been a, a tremendous transformation in GE that has happened in terms of the the, the businesses they're in today versus what they were in, you know, uh, just 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, they're a much more global company. They're a much more industrial company. Um, you know, they've they've had to reconfigure their portfolio of businesses. That's the hardware side. And then there is a software. And if you look at, uh, you know, we teach a case on 20 years of Jack Welch. That's what he did. He fixed the hardware. He also worked on the software. And, I think and if you look at Jeff Immelt, he's also worked on the hardware, and he has worked on the software. I think he'll end up being measured on the on this GE re, uh, revolution, which he's really launched. And we're taking a lot of guts. Uh, there, there's no uh, there's no safety net. Thanks again to Professor Ranjay Galati of the Harbor Business School, particularly because uh, we gave him very short notice on this. He's doing good work for GE. Uh, GE, I want to thank Ranjay of the Harvard Business School, Paul Davies of GE, and Noel Titchie of the Ross School of Business at the University of Michigan. And thanks to our loyal audience for hanging with us. We'll see everybody next Sunday on Business Talk with Jim Campbell.